you are watching or listening to Strangers in Space. And for the next 40 minutes, maybe, we're going to be doing a bit more Doctor Who What If, so you don't have to. Hi, I'm JR. Hi, I'm Matt. Ian. Hi, <laughs> Ian. <laughs> I was Hi, misunderstanding the alphabet. Sorry, John. Go again. Hi, I'm John. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark. Can, can I just can I just point out no. you know, that when I when I asked people don't want to listen to this. When I asked if we could organise who goes in what order, there was eye rolling from certain <laughs> from certain camps. Oh, Matt's going on about the order again. Ugh. That's because you don't understand the alphabet. Because your alphabet, yeah, and it's now infected Ian's how is brain. My, how is this my fault? <laughs> I suspect what's happened is Ian's taken his glasses off and can no longer read the names in front of him, so forgets what alphabetical order they might arrive in. I've got multifocal contacts now, so no. <laughs> <laughs> I've also got a plastic bag at my hip, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> I got it from Matt. <laughs> Excellent. Do you right, check what at the risk... <laughs> It's either a rutan or, yeah, let's not go any further. Let us talk instead. And John, I'm blaming you entirely for this. The last okay. one of these that you were on, one of the questions was, what might have happened if Eric Sayward had left at the end of season 21? No, at the end of season 22, rather, such that when the series came back after its hiatus, it did come back with a new script editor and a new feel and a new focus and a new tone. Ian, Ian. So you said, well, what would have happened if Eric Sayward had quit after season 21 instead? So that's where I'm starting this time, John, because it was your question and you brought it up and because I've laid it on you as a surprise. And of course, the other three didn't know I was going to start by asking this one. And this is not going to be the main focus of this episode, but it is a good way of introducing the other three questions maybe that I have on the side. So we'll see how many we get through, but we'll play it by ear. But see, my contention is if Eric Sayward had quit at the end of 21 and had gone in a timely fashion and JMT had known that he was going and this was all part of a, a plan that they were working out, I don't think they'd have introduced Colin Baker until the beginning of season 22. And it would have been a rather more conventional handover of like story editors and lead actors. Now, I think Colin Baker would still have been JMT's casting, but I think what the question comes down to then is, and there's a bit of a big if in the middle of this, one would a more sympathetic script editor have made the Sixth Doctor a more likeable character, and would Colin Baker have been able to pull that off? And two, Given that Warriors of the Deep is apparently where Michael Grade suggested that he'd seen Doctor Who going off the rails, never to be, uh, you know, recommissioned again. Might it be that with a different script editor, he might have looked in on season 22 and instead of phoning JMT up to cancel it, he might have phoned JMT up and said, oh, actually, you've done a good job of that. Keep it rolling. So that's the question. If Eric Sayward hadn't been there for the start of season 22, are there any names? we potentially think might have taken over? Is there anybody who would have been on the cards? And how do we think Colin Baker might have played out if they hadn't made him into an unlikable Doctor to start with? John, it was your question. Do you want to pick up the baton on that one? I think it's about that time. Chris Boucher is, or Baker is free, isn't he? I, th I think he's done shoestring and by then, so and Berger Act, so I, I think have to say, he's available. Well, I think we're going to be coming back to Chris Boucher anyway in a couple of questions time. And I don't and see my contention would probably be I don't think he would have made a Doctor Who script editor, although it's not impossible, I suppose. Mm. Persuade me if you want. I'm, persuade I'm, me. I'm just saying he was available at the time. And, mm. you know, the I, I, Star Cops was maybe in development there. So, you know, it's seen as a guy who knows his science fiction. He's written for the show before. JNT knows he's written for the show before. JNT quite likes the good people who've written for the show before and doesn't particularly have a good knowledge of the writing world. Well, Boucher so, and Colin Baker had worked together, however closely or not, on Blake 7. Colin Baker turns up yes. in a pretty big part in one of the episodes. Are, are you saying we get a doctor like Babe and the Butcher? 
because I'm all in on that. <laughs> no, well, this is precisely my anyway, question. <laughs> I think this is rather my point. I think if Boucher had been Sayward's replacement, it might have been something of more of the same. I think I think he would have a much better handle on writing lines for Colin. Because Maybe, their sense of humour I mean is, is quite similar, quite dark, the, quite nihilistic. But so was Sayward's. I think my yeah, point but Sayward is that was really pro- crap at dialogue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm talking about the tone of the program. I think if Sayward would have gone, it would have been a little bit like you get with the Doctors, where you would want to, to sort of steer the ship in a different direction with somebody new, rather than see. I think Chris Boucher potentially is basically just a better. Well, version of Eric Sayward, but it would have been similar, maybe. I'm not entirely sure that's true. But I, I think, think that's he's better on structure. Part. Um so yeah, I think the tone would be quite similar, but that wasn't an uncommon tone in the media of that time. So I think you'd draw on similar influences, certainly. Yeah, maybe. Anybody else got thoughts of a name who might have come in other than I mean, was there anybody working on i mean chris bailey is the obvious one that people throw out i don't think chris bailey would have been a tv script editor no. i think you would probably have wanted to give it to somebody who knew a little bit more about television dudley dudley, dudley. yeah wow probably. yes oh i mean <laughs> i mean he was like pretty he's pretty old even then wasn't he but it's the sort of thing you might do as a kind of safe pair of hands in a kind of transition period to bring someone like Terence Dudley in. Just, I mean, uh, I, and yeah. it might be all right, just, you know, bring in somebody who writes in a very, very conventional way. See, the thing about Terence Dudley is he also has relations, Ooh. relationships, <laughs> relationships with people like um, Tony Fergo and John Black, other directors from the sort of JNT period, people that I they'd worked think... together with on All Creatures Great and Small, and people who'd worked with Dudley on Survivors. I, and what I think he'd had of... trouble re- uh, working with JNT because um, he did like to take over the shows that he came in on. You know, he, t- he took Survivors in a very different direction. Doomwatch um, really annoyed um, Kit Peddler and Jerry Davis, as I remember. So I... having said that, those are programmes where he's the producer and he is in charge, right? Yeah, but he's the script the editor. Step back. Well, this is the point. Terence Dudley is one of those old school professionals. Matt sort of alludes to it. If he comes in as a script editor, then I think the relationship is a different one. And Terence Dudley, I mean, from what I can tell, Terence Dudley is the kind of person who says, OK, you're in charge. You're the boss. Here are my ideas. Because let's be honest, Terence Dudley directs three Doctor Who stories and writes, is it three? No, he directs one at least and writes three for JMT anyway. So it's not like Terence Dudley didn't take instruction from JMT on Doctor Who all through the Peter Davison era. And here's the other point about Terence Dudley. We might look at his Doctor Who scripts and think, oh, they're a bit weak. But I think we also look at Terence Dudley's Doctor Who script and think, nice idea, execution not so great. Now, if he's to come in as a story editor, isn't nice idea, get somebody else to do the execution, exactly what you want? No, so, because you want you want a script editor to... I, on the one hand, yes, that is what you want. You want yeah. a guy who can pick out those ideas. But you want somebody who, if the script isn't up to scratch, like, say, for example, The Twin Dilemma, you want somebody to (laughs) hammer that into place, into something that, you know, is a broadcastable bit of television. And I don't know if Terence Dudley has those particular skills. Go on, Ian, you were about to say something as well. I think that makes a good point, but I... (laughs) <laughs> well, just to round off from what Margaret said, I think you make a good point. I also wonder if because you've got somebody else, another writer, maybe the plot's not quite adding up, but maybe it is in Terence Studley's skill set to bring the plot around if somebody else has put in the backbone of it in the first place. Did Ian, sorry. Studley write Black Orchid? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And are we all in agreement that Black Orchid, were it not for the first two minutes of episode one, would have been a whodunit? And is that not the kind of heavy lifting that a script editor should be doing to structure the story in such a way that it tells a story that works? 
Uh, and isn't that evidence right there that he just doesn't have what it takes? But uh, but a script editor doesn't necessarily have to sort out the story mechanics. So if a scaffolding's there, a script editor could like. But you know, but Dudley, by definition, couldn't because he's got no idea about structure because he's proved mm. that with. No, exactly. So, <laughs> but he does have an idea about atmosphere and setting and and things like that. So Robert Holmes. I think this is where Robert Holmes differs from Terence Dix. Terence Dix is a great scaffolder, story scaffolder. Robert Holmes, I don't think, is a story scaffolder. I think Robert Holmes is like is like Moffat. I'm just going to say, keep going, going on. Like, it's like Moffat, that he adds so much atmosphere and humour and character to his scripts. You don't care that they're structured in a really weird way. Or So he's or, more of a plasterer. Everything ends with it blowing up. Yeah, <laughs> a, stucco, a stucco plasterer. And I think that <laughs> yeah. Terence Dudley isn't as exciting as Robert Holmes, but I think I think that's not the point. I think the point is, is he a safe pair of hands at Since this point? Does the BBC know him? And on Matt's point, I think Terence, Terence Dudley is not incredibly unlike his almost namesake, Terence Dix, in the way he can bring ideas out and put stories together. And here's another point. I'm currently two thirds of the way through a rewatch of the whole of the original three series of Survivors, which is going to be on a future episode, so I don't want to spoil it too much before we talk about it there. But Terence Dudley's basically in charge of that pretty much from the get-go, and he's definitely in charge of it by the second season. And whatever problems the second season might have, the storytelling is not the problem. I mean, there's a massive issue when they lose their main set at the start of the series, and the first six scripts suffer because they've got to be rewritten for an entirely different scenario with entirely different characters and so forth. But by the end of the second season, he's really brought it around and the stories are quite strong. And so, I, see, I think for me, Terence Studley's thing is he's quite good at people and he's quite good at ordinary stories. He's not so good at science fiction and the logistics of extrapolated science. So I think he falls down a bit in Doctor Who because the extrapolated science isn't there. But give Terence Dudley the job of corralling the other writers into coming up with ideas and giving them extrapolated science. I do wonder if Terence Dudley is not a bad pair of hands to have for, say, two years during that transitional period with Colin Baker. And imagine what the writer of Black Orchid would do with Colin Baker. That would be fun, wouldn't it? I think Colin Baker in the Peter Davison role in something like yeah. Black Orchid could be fun. I well, he had Adric going to a buffet, cake. so <laughs> I don't know what he'd do with Colin to fight a <laughs> contest. Does he? he might, <laughs> but he'd be a lot less unlikable and a lot more charismatic, I think. He was brought think... in for his charisma, and then they made him the least charismatic of all the Doctors. A ridiculous well, this, thing to do. This is the most interesting thing about your question, which is if Seward goes at the end of the Davison era, what does that do to the Colin Baker era? And I know yeah. obviously that all depends on who kind of comes in to replace him. But let's just say they do they just grab a writer that none of us have thought of and has this yeah, bold yeah. new vision for Doctor Who and we go from there. Um and I think Which is yeah, Jenny's history with script editors, if you look. Well yeah, 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 yeah. I mean Cartmel is the perfect example, which is what he would then go on to do and well, kind of rejuvenate the show. Um but I think it would. I think it would absolutely change. I think it would know. I think with a decent script editor who can write dialogue and can create characters that like each other, mm-hmm. I think you would have you would have a similar relationship to the, to the Sixth Doctor and Perry, but it would be more like the Tenth Doctor and Donna, where it's kind of yeah. good natured bickering rather than just two people being horrible to each other. Well, this is the thing. You only get that because Sayward's on his second Doctor. Like you only get that with Moffat because Moffat's on his second Doctor because you've already done the likeable Doctor. So what else is there to do if you want to change it than to do a dislikable Doctor? But if you bring somebody else instead, they're not going to start and say, oh, what can I do on Doctor Who? I know, I'll make him unlikable. They're going to come in and do a likeable Doctor. The slightly more more interesting question is what what would have happened if Sayward had stayed another season? (laughs) <laughs> then he'd be on to his third doctor and that is a no oh, I mean, the, pro- the problem of the problem of what happens if i say with leaves is it's kind of unknowable what about grim wade sorry i'm just 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Grim Raid. Yeah, that's, that's I possibly. think, yes, Grim Raid's a good answer, but I think Grim Raid had just had his falling out with JMT at this point, hadn't he? Well, yeah. So but, that aside, mm, yeah. yeah. The BBC is like an impossible, it's impossible to find yeah, somebody yeah. who has I'm, I'm trying to go with young, kind of younger writers who are around at that time, because it would be a younger up and coming writer mm-hmm. in the mid 80s. So someone who's working on a series, so maybe the writers who are on kicking off on Howard's Way or, um, or Robin of Show. Um, well, here's a mad oh, what's question. his face? What Anthony does... Thingy. Um, Steve. No, got his, got his break off. Robin Show wrote Carpenter. Young, young James Bond stuff, isn't it? I think the oh, oh Horowitz. Anthony Horowitz. Yeah, he 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 might have been an interesting answer at that point. What time does J and uh, at what point does RTD's career kick off? That's just after this, isn't it? It's, uh, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's that my the uh, the Hodiak script was eighty six, eighty seven. If he submitted that, wasn't it? I think. But his first yeah. television is like eighty nine, ninety, yeah. isn't it? I think. Yeah, it's, that's yeah, why that's don't why you? don't you? Yeah. Mm. Although it's, <laughs> it's not entirely impossible he might have been around. So, so I've got a, that, I've, a, can I ask a question? Answer. Yeah, yeah. What supposing Sayward leaves and JNT entrusts the show to the capable hands of Pip and Jane Baker as script editors? Oh, actually, that's a well, point. well, practically, does, it is from like, how does season twenty-two, you know, go off the boil? Oh God! <laughs> oh God! Ian's Ian's just made a really good point. It would be Pip and Jane Baker, wouldn't it? It probably would be. It yeah. would absolutely be Pip and Jane Baker, and oh, and it would but be like, again, what, on, what on fucking earth? <laughs> I think that comes Sorry. back though to my point again is that they Sorry, wouldn't be too. writing the stories, and actually Pip and they, Jane they Baker are, for all the execution, they are very good on structure. <laughs> the structures yeah. of, if of, only there was, an but they do write down for a, a very young audience by implication. I think. I don't think that's a problem. I don't think that's a problem. No, not for not me. particularly. But... but also, the other thing is, whatever you think of the execution, I think their ideas are sound, really. I mean, Terror of the Vervoids was just the right idea for that point in The Trial of the Time Lord. Well, Mark of the two, Rani's a good two idea. Two of the three are doing exactly what Kant Moth does, an absolutely lacerating Thatcher, aren't they? You know, a chemist who uh, who exploits miners for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even time in the Rani, if it had had its jungle setting, and if the sort of you know the bees and oh, uh, uh, terror of time in the Rani is as much about pr- problems with the production as it is about yes. problems with the script. I think the script itself to have Rani and Mel swapping places, I think that's a little stroke of genius. I think it's only that Sylvester McCoy doesn't have the first clue what to do with the character that kind of rubs you up the wrong way at the start of that story. And I think some of the else of it, some of the rest of it's quite sound. That that if somebody else had written it, and if the production team had been a bit more sympathetic to it, because I don't think the production team's quite sort of au fait with what they're doing quite yet and that kind of grows over the next couple of years doesn't it and also it was chaos at that yeah absolutely as well it's very much like this is the only script we have because eric sayward has left a sort of half drunk wine glass and a revolver or something in a locked drawer (laughs) and just left and and that's all there is that's left of doctor who is just this script for time of the rani it's yeah it, that's kind of what it comes out of so in this parallel world we wouldn't have that but we might have a good version of time in the rally you never know actually i quite like it yeah yeah i, like I it, don't like i it. don't mind time <laughs> in the rally yeah, yeah. um an- another thing that that occurs is that had it been someone like terence dudley or pip and jane baker i just um, want to break in at this point to point yeah. out that uh, this was supposed to be the five-minute question to start the episode. It's so interesting. I've done, done, artwork. It's a rich one. I've done artwork for the question I was going to follow it up with, it's... which it looks like we're never going to get to. This is not a five-minute question, Joe. You right? start You've with my your questions. Empty my... Bottle. Yeah. my questions are all good. They have me so, on the bone. Yeah. So had it been either of those, um, Terence Dudley or Pip and Jane Baker, who both had, I'm going to say, a kind of more of a, 60s who than a contemporary who kind of grounding the show would have been even more out of kilter with what was on tv around it and when everyone at my school was watching the a-team or knight rider or whatever or buck rogers doctor who would have just got more and more eccentric to be watching and it might have killed it quicker 
But here's a question for you. Were they also watching Doctor Who? No. And yet, that's the Doctor Who that resembles the A-Team and Knight Rider. God, They'd have been more likely to watch it. Went, it was Perry Ma- or Perry Mason, then. And I put it to you. And yet... <laughs> Hang out, Perry yet, Mason, what are you saying about... Stood this room. <laughs> You'd be a fat phobic here. <laughs> but just see what I mean. The further away Doctor Who is from the television around it, the more likely people are to find it as an alternative to that television. I think Doctor Who suffers in the 80s because Eric Sayward wants to make it like all these sort of violent police procedurals, and that's not its natural sort of yeah. being. It wants Eric, to reflect. Eric Sayward things, isn't but... interested in Doctor Who. That's that's the main issue with with Eric Sayward, um, and I don't. And I think that's partly because. He doesn't enjoy working with John Nathan Turner. But also, as I've said many times before, we've all worked with somebody like Eric Saywards, who kind of just can't be bothered doing their job properly and kind of just blames everybody else but themselves. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a Sayward fan. Right. I'm going to move on to the second question because I suspect now that we're not going to get to the third and fourth. So we'll just save those for another time. But this second one is kind of related to the first, which is why I started with the question that John had come up with. And the question is this. And this is more and this really is more of a what if. And this is definitely not a this might have happened. But this is me asking you to just imagine something. And my question is this. What if Terence Dix and Eric Sayward had been in one another's places? In other words, what if Eric Sayward had been the script editor for Doctor Who for the John Pertwee era? How would that have looked? And what if Terence Dix had been the script editor for the first five years of JNT with Peter Davison and that? How would let's start there with Terence Dix? If Terence Dix had been writing the stories, a slightly more traditional style of story, while JNT had been the producer, how would Terence Dix have taken on board all the, right, we need to have this kind of a character in this story, we want to set it in this location, I'm casting these two guest actors because they're friends of mine and I've offered them a part in Doctor Who. Would Terence Dix have been okay with all of that? I mean, have you seen the five doctors? Yeah, that's pretty (laughs) much what you're talking about. (laughs) But would he have been able to do that week in, week out? Is my question really? Yes, it's Terence because he does that for Barry Letts anyway, pretty much, doesn't he? Yeah, he 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 was. um, Here you go. Give me two drafts. There you go. I'll do the top. I'll do the final one. So yes, he's quite a dominant voice. Yep. Also, Terence was very good at turning around to people and going, you're aware that we have about five pence and like a bit of string. Whereas Sayward was never good at that. I think the, the part, I was watching the documentary about Kinder a couple of weeks back and he talks about how, oh yeah, the snake's not very good. I said, yeah, if only there was a script editor around to <laughs> sort of point out to the writer that ending with a giant snake maybe wasn't wasn't going to work. Um, where I think Terence Dix is very aware of of kind of television production and, and the role of a script editor to kind of point these things <laughs> out to the writer. Of well, <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. That was Barry Letts' fault, though, anyway, yeah. wasn't it's it? It's a belter, though. It's a belter, regardless. Know, really good, yeah. <laughs> There's a really good Black Archive on it as well. I wonder who wrote that. It wasn't Matt <laughs> the Demon's Barber, by any chance, was no, it? No, I've only got one Black Archive that I have to flog endlessly. To... <laughs> In fact, was it Dylan Downtime Reese? <laughs> No, no, he's only he hasn't yeah. written a black or silver archive yet. Was it John Rosal? It might be. Uh, could could be. <laughs> so uh, before we move back to Eric Sayward, because clearly Eric Sayward, John Pertwee, Barry Letts, that's where this question's headed, right? But before we leave Terence Dix, how different does Doctor Who look for those first few years of because the thing about it is you've got, first of all, Christopher Bidmead. I suppose let's say Terence Dix gets installed after season 18, so it's from 19 onwards, but let's say he gets installed at the start. You don't have that weird, messy season 19 where there's no proper script editor and so there's no cohesion between the stories. You get something that's more coherent with Terence Dix. Is it a bit drabber? Does Doctor Who become a little bit dull for four years? Because one thing you can say about the Eric Saywood era that sort of seasons 20 through to 22 23 years you know it does get to be a little bit wild in places i mean season 20 might be the dullest season of doctor who that was ever broadcast but that's not for its want of trying to be 
anything but dull, is it? And season 21 and season 22, I mean, terrible television, but fascinating to watch. Is Terence Dix's version of Doctor Who in the 1980s a little bit dull? Well, I always, I always found the Pert era a little bit dull, but that's purely because it's absolutely consistent. It's one of those you can stick almost any story on and it's not going to be terrible, even if it might be slightly on the dull side. There's always a base level of quality. Yeah. And the thing Terence does is, they, I, I believe the ratings increase in every Pertwee season. So I think he tells us, he does what RTD does uh, later on. He knows how to tell a story an audience wants to see, to hear. Yeah, yeah. So I think Doctor Who is in a far more healthy shape going into whoever would follow him if he's popped over from doing classic serials. Yeah, yeah. So you think actually he takes the 1980s? Because the 1980s, the audience kind of goes down year on year, not by a huge amount until you get yeah. to Trial of the Time Lord, but just a little bit. You think he that trajectory goes the other way of Terence I, Dix's I there? think it goes the other way. If it's only slightly, it goes... It would go upward, I think, because Terence, again, and he would know how to work with that budget, as we've just said. I tell you what you wouldn't have is three bickering teens, you know, just to generalise, no, no. in the TARDIS. You'd have had, you might have had three companions, but actually they'd have had a better relationship with one another, right? Yeah, absolutely. Presumably they'd have had the kind of relationship that he would have created in some weird parallel 70s where he'd created the unit family instead <laughs> so they well, might have actually cohered and worked really well yeah and sure. built on you know the, one of the reasons these ratings are going up year on year is that we're we're loving this kind of fam of companions right. <laughs> it, it's people you want to spend time with fundamentally yeah. Yeah. Right. Ian's come up with the perfect segue there. So I don't care what Mark and Matt might have to say about er <laughs> Terrence Dix in the 80s. I've got to ask this now. What what the criminy would UNIT have been like if Eric Sayward had been in charge for five years? I've got an answer to this. It would basically be the doctor would be an irritant. So, you know, obviously in, in the Perch era, it's all about the third doctor. Can I try to civilise the British military? And can I say, look, you don't always have to blow stuff up, right? There's always another way. Um, Eric Sayward's 1970s doctor would very much be unit blowing things up. And the doctor's going, oh, I wish you, oh, I wish you hadn't done that, which I know happens in the Silurians, but that's the point And that's a kind of crucial part of the character arc. It would be that every bloody week. Or he'd be prodding them into blowing stuff up without yeah. saying it out yeah. loud and then telling yeah. them off for it afterwards. The doctor would have his finger on that button first up. You'd and have... rather than Venusian Aikido, it would be a knife. It would just be John Perch, <laughs> just stabbing, just stabbing but, folk. Or, but this also, sort of stems... you'd, Sorry. You'd have Benton and Yates and they'd probably be modelled after the Sweeney. Yeah. Yeah. But they'd, they'd be more kind of violent and cockney and slightly edgy. So those like, characters, yeah. there wouldn't Lit have been a family Lit feel Lit to um, it. It would be a, you know, slightly sort of edgy kind of... Well, it would have been Captain yeah. Brody and Sergeant Doyle. And then yeah. Yeah, George Watts' I, I was going to say, say um, Morris Colburn and Brian Glover in Attack of the Sidemen, that type of relationship. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, you, yeah. you see, I've always assumed that most of the kind of anger in Sayward scripts comes from his relationship with JNT. And had he got on with Barry Letts like a house on fire, maybe he's not a, a violent, miserable human being. Maybe oh, suddenly my. there's a whole different side Would he have him. taken up Buddhism? <laughs> what? That is a... <laughs> I take that parallel universe. Five, five kinders in a row. Well, then, see, it's, see it's this is the thing. I think the relationship between the two of them might have started off with Barry Letts treating him a bit like a sort of naughty errant schoolboy but at the end of the five years i think we'd have all been looking for eric sayward's bones in the backyard of barry letts's house that's, that, that's see, the, see, the my, buddhist my, way <laughs> i i did have a short answer which was it would be cancelled inside two seasons because doctor nearly was cancelled in 1970 yeah. but i think i think the key the key to answering both questions is who who barry letts is and who J and T is yes, and yes. J and T isn't a writer. He's a kind of a show producer. Barry Letts is a writer and wants to be a writer and writes all the time, and he directs. So, Eric Saywood and another strong writer may maybe 
would be better. Maybe they'd get along a bit better. Maybe they'd be on the same wavelength. I mean, James, if you look yes. at his relationship Dicks. with Robert Holmes, you know, he, he's yeah. very much enthralled to Holmes when, when yeah. he brings him aboard in the 80s. Mm. So you could see a version where with Barry Letts, he kind of sees him more as a mentor than this kind of irritant that he oh. saw John Nathan Turner as. Yeah, because the thing about it is, Eric Sayward comes in as an unseasoned television professional and quite young too. And the way Eric Sayward ages in the programme is directly as a result of working with JNT and not having that mentoring relationship. If you've got that mentoring relationship with Barry Letts instead, Eric Sayward develops very differently probably. I don't know. I think you get Terror of the Autos put on about 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's easy. Yes, that is easy to say, and we can all imagine it. But having said that, that first season that um, Eric Sayward is in charge of, season 20, that's kind of tame by Doctor Who standards. It's only with season 21, when he's sort of two years into the job, that things mm. start getting a bit out of hand. I mean, that, I that's know. why I said Terry the Odds, because it's, it starts off, you're coming off season seven, which is as gritty as Doctor Who gets. So you're already in that headspace, whereas Saywood, as you point out, he goes down into the darkness. He's starting in the darkness with season seven, essentially, and the moral grey areas. Possibly, but here's the other sort of end of that question. In the 1970s, Terence Dix is a great story editor for Doctor Who, but he doesn't write anything. The only one he actually writes is Robot, which is a sort of farewell story because he wants that extra payday when Robert Holmes takes over. And yet Eric Saywood, on the other hand, is writing a story a year, if not two, there are a couple of years where he basically does two, even if it's not got his name on both of them. Attack of the Cybermen and Re Revelation of the Daleks, for example. So there are. Mm. So he's writing at least a story a year. Yeah, and the if back the end positions... between dilemma is his, if I remember rightly. Yeah, so if, um, yeah, The Awakening, I think he rewrites The, <laughs> the Awakening, basically. Nobody wants to be at the back end of the window. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, like, what, did it suddenly go off a cliff? No, it was all um, very much on the same level, so. But that point being, what Eric Saywood, during the Barry Letts era, doesn't get a chance to write any stories because Barry Letts, with five stories a year, and if Barry Letts is writing one of them, he's not going to let the script editor write one of the others and then be down to just three guest writers. So Eric Saywood then becomes, and I mean... I don't think he'd be angry or upset or irritated by this because this is the job that he'd be offered as somebody who has no experience in television. Just come in and look after the stories and look after the writers and make sure everything adds up. So I think we don't get the Eric Sayward written stories. So I wonder if that means also that it doesn't tip over too far into the violence. There's also a slight difference between the nature of the Doctor Who production at that time and in the 80s. Hmm. So Terence Dix and Barry Letts were kind of co-producing, de facto co-producers. And so the script editor in the 1970s was a sort of trainee, trainee role for a future producer, which Terence Dix becomes. Eric Saywood has no chance of becoming a producer in the BBC because by the 1980s, it's sort of stopped being that kind yeah, of yeah. career progression. But also yeah, he's everybody hates, everybody hates JNT. So any any script editor to JNT isn't going to be elevated to producership. Like it's it's basically the script editor to JNT is kind of is kind of the final job you'll get <laughs> the, the BBC <laughs> really at that point because everybody hates it. But in the seventies, if Sayward seeing this as a sort of you know you know if I put in four or five years, I could be a producer by the end of it and do my own thing and write my own thing, then he'll probably be much more settled. Yeah, Anthony Reid's the last one who goes on to be a producer, isn't he, I think, on in terms of script editors? Douglas I Adams doesn't, yeah, yeah. then none of yeah. JNT's do. Yeah, yeah it's a very different time, because you get Thatcher arrives in 79, doesn't she? And that changes the political landscape. And the it's main all Thatcher's thing... fault, as we can... <laughs> What well, if it, yeah, what if instead of Thatcher we'd had Saywood? <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> they would never have had the happiness patrol. <laughs> you need that side man in the wig picture, JR, for this. I think Thatchos. 
I think um, the point I was making, though, about Thatcher is once she comes in, then the idea of institutions just rolling along the way institutions have done goes out the window, doesn't it? Then it becomes all about, you know, you must employ people from the outside. And then it becomes about putting people onto contracts rather than giving them commissions and jobs, long term jobs. It's the long term job nature of it that changes, isn't it? And then obviously it leads to these sort of independent production sort of tender system for sort of BBC yeah. productions as well. And I I was thinking about this the other day, actually. It's quite interesting that the Jodie Whittaker era comes to a point where the BBC realise they can't make Doctor Who anymore unless it's a global co-production. And then you look at sort of JNT's era as we're on the cusp of that kind of thing where you break the BBC up into independent production companies and nobody has the thought to go, what if we... What if we did Doctor Who as a co-production? Because nobody cares. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't know. Oh, Actually, they, they, come the, end the end of, the 80s, of it, they, they tried, didn't they? They tried to yeah, do yeah. that, and they couldn't find anybody that they mm, could do sure. it with. And the Five Doctors is technically a co-production, isn't it? I think it was That's Canada. true, actually. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. there Terry Nation and Jerry Davis got together? They were to, one, uh, but there were plenty of others. Verity Lambert. I'm not sure if she actually pitched, but she certainly... Was she, not, she asked to be kept informed, if I remember. So I remember. Mm. Yeah, so she was definitely there or thereabouts, and a few other people were. Um, speaking of the uh, Jodie Whittaker era, uh, this uh, new series of Pointless just started. So the f- summer repeats have finished and they've just started a new series. And um, uh, one of the uh, categories that you can have in the sort of final round at the end is the Jodie Whittaker era of Doctor Who. <laughs> So <laughs> don't respect it yet. I don't know what the questions are, but it'll come up in the next few days. It'll, it'll, that'll be the first time today. will be the first one that's come up then. <laughs> I've been watching it. it. hasn't been up before. Oh, has it not? I don't watch no, it every day. I just catch day. it occasionally and it was on today. So, yeah, it was, it, that one will have just come up today then probably by the sound of it. And by the time people hear this on their audio feeds, it'll be long gone. Tim Shaw is probably a pointless answer, right? Who knows All of the general public is the only one I can remember. So no. <laughs> I wonder if the question is something like name any actors who've had recurring roles during the Jodie Whittaker era. So you would have people like um, the guy from uh, Sex and the City, whose so name you, escapes you, me. You'd have a bunch Chris, of actors you're not like Chris to mention. Yeah, so Chris yeah. North, John Barrow. Cancelled, cancelled. <laughs> guys, yeah. yeah. guys, you could make a season trailer out of. <laughs> I've got to imagine that would be the question, though, because I can't really think what other question you could ask of the general public. Name any episode of the Jodie Whittaker era. But naming episodes isn't a pointless round, is it? Not on regular um, purpose. Well, it has, it would be it about... has been. Actually, there has been a Doctor Who round on it, um, one of the last ones. And that was on a Doctor pretty Who much special, though, everything was pointless. <laughs> oh, yeah, because nobody, and so they're not going to do that again. Yeah, no, name no. actors you recognize is far more likely, I would have thought. Mm. Yeah, um... anyway, that's a weird tangent to end on. Shall I throw in a very, very short question for us to finish with then? I was going to ask David Moss's question because he's been waiting for me to ask it for about two months now, but that's too big a question for now. So, David, I'm going to ask that one next time. <laughs> Poor David, you were you sitting there listening, oh. going, "Oh, here we go, was, here we go." Edge of his here's chair. My name now, now is my moment. No, no. His question is an episode or half an episode at least in itself. I'm not oh. going to ask it now with like two minutes left to go. But here's You'll one that just that. here's one that struck me as just something that you could two minutes in and it's this JNT wanted to bring Sarah Jane Smith back Elizabeth Sladen back for the sort of end of the Tom Baker era to sort of bridge into the Peter Davison era so I'm asking this I'm asking just imagine she'd said yes a does she just do three stories like I don't know Logopolis Castrovalva and then maybe leaves maybe does one more or does she stick around for a season and so does she work with JNT, with Peter Davison, with that production team, with that kind of Doctor Who. Does she stick around? Does she look like a fish out of water? Sure. Does it make more sense of K9 and Company? Does K9 and Company therefore go on to be a hit series because she's been in the main programme? I'm sorry, John, we're supposed to answer this in two minutes. Did you say? John, John Arnold doesn't think Elizabeth Sladen's a very good actress. So who knows? <laughs> who knows what he thinks she might do? I I've always wondered about that. I mean, I know it was kind of a very early thing, and obviously I'm sure Logopolis doesn't bear any resemblance to what it would look like if Liz Sladen had said yes. But I do wonder if, like, where she would fit in, say, Logopolis did 
end up the way it does. Is she Nyssa or is she Tegan? I think she's Tegan, isn't she? I, I think don't she wanders, know. See, because I think I she feel... wanders into a shrinking TARDIS, knowing that it's the TARDIS, yeah, and mm-hmm. looking for the Doctor. So yeah, I, I think yeah. she's the Tegan, and also we've heard so much about Aunt. What's her aunt called? Aunt Lavinia. Aunt mm. Lavinia, Aunt Vanessa. I do wonder if that's where the origins of Aunt Vanessa come from. But then there's your answer. She leaves in um, time flight. But it's not time flight. It's some other Earth-based adventure where she goes back to Metropolitan Magazine. Yeah, yeah. set in a newspaper office. <laughs> yeah. But does she fit in? And is that season more fun because she's there instead of Tegan? She would have been, what, a, a year or two older than Peter Davison? That would have been a nice dynamic. Yeah, she's in this world. So yeah, they would have had a more. um, Who was it? Was it was in? There's a really good podcast called On the Time Rush. I was listening to. Oh, bless you. They were talking about. Oh, it's really good. (laughs) Um, They were they were talking about. I can't remember the name of Nera Hughes's character, but you would presumably. Yeah. You could maybe have got that kind of dynamic instead of Crash Man and the bickering babies. So oh, again, it. it's been really good, especially if Terence Dix had been script writing. But Tegan should have been the other grown up in the TARDIS, shouldn't she? With yes. Nessa and Adric as the youngsters, but they just never played it that way. No, but not it, having it, a script editor that was lost. And Kinder wasn't the only time Peter Davison did quite well with a slightly older or older woman as a sort of castmate. So, mm. well, Kinder twice, but you know, Enlightenment oh, yes. and. The awakening, uh, the awakening. The awakening. Mm-hmm. your practice, yep. <laughs> yes. champion. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? Not the true dire- detective or something. What's the last detective. The last detective. Last detective. Last detective. Not, it's not the true detective. <laughs> I couldn't remember what it's called. Is that it then? Any more thoughts on Elizabeth Sladen? Would we have liked to have seen her back? John, I know you wouldn't, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I think it, it is a really nice dynamic. I, I would, I would watch that one. Yeah, I'd be quite happy yeah. to watch it. I mean, it Even it if might, you know, it's it not might be Davidson. It might be Davidson would have helped her with her acting. Exactly. <laughs> Matthew. Or Waterhouse maybe Matthew Waterhouse. Waterhouse. <laughs> yes. yes. Matthew Waterhouse would help. <laughs> this is a camera. <laughs> right. That is definitely the note upon which we should end. Until we come back with David Moss's question next time. I was Jr. I was Matt. I was Ian. I was John. And I was Mark. And we will speak again soon.